I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bigfoot, America's Creek Devil. Fred in Alaska has consented to join us once again. He's got updates, new things going on, and all kinds of interesting things up there. But Tom's going to make an announcement before we get started. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in this week. And uh, you guys know what to do. If you like the show, let us know. Click the like and subscribe button if you haven't subscribed already. And uh, if you really want to support the show uh, in a monetary sense, you can do so. If you're on YouTube, there's a link in the description. You just clink, clink, yeah, clink it. Give it a click. <laughs> the Patreon <laughs> Give it a clink. link. <laughs> Give it a clink in the Patreon description. And you can you can become a member uh, just for as little as a dollar a month. And that helps us tremendously to get you the content. So with that said, I will hand the mic. I will clink it back clink over it. to Will. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I mean, we're, we're not that savvy as far as YouTube goes. So we didn't really pay that much attention all this time to the likes, you know. And it's not a big deal to like the video if you if you do like it. But what I found out is... Um, it, it's what, it's how it enables other people to see it in their feeds. So when people say, well, you know, you guys really should have more views. It's a great show. You should have more views. Well, we'd have more views if people would click the like button. That, that would be a huge help for us guys. Alrighty. So having said all that, uh, Fred and I talked earlier this week and Fred, you've got, you've always got interesting stuff before you get started though. Tell everybody where they can find your YouTube page. Fred's got a fascinating show. Uh, yeah, I have the, well, the website is linked. It's subarticalaskasasquatch.com. I have an interactive map of Alaska there to where you zoom in on a spot and you click one of the marker pins and it's embedded with my YouTube channel. So it'll pull up a brief description of the encounter and then you can go to the video of the encounter from that area. And the uh, YouTube channel is the same name, subarticalaskasasswatch.com, or YouTube, forgive me. Long days, land of the midnight sun is unforgiving when uh, your senses are telling you it's midday, but it's 10 o'clock. So it kind of, you know, throws your, your days off and all bleeds together. That would do it. <laughs> so I guess, I don't know where you want to start. I mean, you've always got so much stuff going on, but uh, I guess maybe start with telling everybody about what you told me about the lady who had the creature or creatures around her home. Yeah, that's in the Copper River Valley. And uh, if anyone's done any research, the, I mean, the, that valley has a long history of high strangeness, whether it be uh, <clears throat> Atna natives talking about uh, villagers going missing, uh, other hunters from the village seeing, you know, the hairy man or Sasquatch messing with human bones, um, all the way to the devil monkeys up by Salcha. Uh, that it's, it's a long legacy of, uh, not our friends, <laughs> you know, uh, they're just like, for example, uh, the double thing, I, it's relative, I've heard about it before, but I've been doing the hairy man thing and some little people experiences. So, exploring the devil monkey aspect of it uh about seven eight years ago uh there was the report of someone's campsite torn to shreds blood everywhere and it was uh, i believe it was west of Salcha, and it was reported as bear predation well talking to people locally there i talked to an athabascan uh, elder his name is oscar he's not from there but his family lives there and his nephew happened to be one of the first people to come upon that campsite his report to the powers that be were four to five five foot plus monkeys with long tails uh just a little shorter than the average human 
with human-like faces fleeing the area when they pulled up there on four wheels. That's not part of the official narrative. It's that part was left out and it was a bear predation. Even though they found no parts of this guy's body, like a bear would bury it, you know, defecate on it in the mound of, you know, vegetation and, and sit on it until it was done feeding. None of that was found in the area. Just guy was gone without a trace and they totally ignored the report of the four to five monkeys that uh, the guy, when, when I asked Oscar about it, it was conveyed to me that they looked uh, body structure wise, like large lemurs. However, they were a little more robust and human like faces. So that that's what I've heard about. Them. Um, there's also historical uh, stories, uh, there's, there's a, another YouTube channel uh, out of Canada, Hammerson Peters, and he did a couple of videos uh, along the same lines and uh, some of the same stories out of Salcha where uh, natives had gone missing. A young native boy followed uh, some weird sounds, came across a group of these things uh, messing with human bones as well tracked them back to their layers and went and got the rest of the villagers and they basically set fires in front of the caves and attacked these beings as they came out and killed most of them. So there, there's a long history of that and it's delving into it is kind of hard outside of a few anecdotal references getting better explanations and, and better context to what's actually going on. You know what I mean? It, it makes it difficult, especially when a lot of the native peoples, they, they don't share too much, um, you know, and I'm still having difficulties with that, even though, you know, I'm first nations myself, it's it just making inroads and, and introducing yourself to new people. It, they're all a bit standoffish, you know, so it kind of makes it hard getting, you know, all the real juicy tidbits. So that that's where that portion of it's at. And as far as the ladies' cabin, um, we were down there a couple of weeks ago, taking a look around since the snow melted. And uh, there was an 18-inch track next to her house. Uh, it was about four feet, or not four feet, but four inches of a depression and semi-hard mud. Uh, within 48 hours of the track being made, and it, it it was it was daunting because this lady is 78 years old. She lives on her own, and this activity has kicked up since her husband passed in 2019. So we're looking around for other evidence. Uh, there's some broken, twisted trees, uh, you know, X markings out in the middle of nowhere with two trees pushed across each other on these small game trails. Just, you know, small pieces of evidence like that. And then we were sitting there discussing you know the evidentiary value of what we had come across so far during our visit and she notices this orb outside the window and it was about 30 yards from the window and i went and sat where she was sitting because i couldn't see it at first and then i saw it and i thought oh that's probably light refraction either from the kitchen light or a light outside because it was about 12:08 a.m Land of the midnight sun, though, it was still daylight out with, without sunlight. So I decided to go outside to investigate it because I've never seen an orb like that. So I go outside, and I'm off to the right-hand side of the driveway, and I'm looking at this thing, and it is uh, a cream, a very light creamsicle orange color, opaque, not, not a bright light, and it starts shimmering and starts moving away. So I cross the driveway to get a better look at this thing and get up on this little dirt mound. And when I get up on that dirt mound, this thing starts shimmering more and moving away into the woods, almost like it was trying to lure me away from the house. And I, was, I wasn't I was having none of that. So I backtracked to the house, went inside, and a moment later, a red orb shows up and does a, a, a very similar kind of pattern, kind of weaving back and forth in the trees. And like we discussed, that's potentially ball lightning or, you know, things of that nature. So it, it's just the creep factor of what we were dealing with as far as, you know, looking at the hairy man evidence. And then all of a sudden this shows up. It, it was just a, a real creepy, creepy incident. You know what I mean? Hey, Fred, this is Tom. Uh, I got a question yeah, for Tom. you about the historic precedent 
of devil monkeys up in Alaska because Will sent me a picture, gosh, about two years ago, two, three years ago, of some carvings. I think Will was in British Columbia of something with ear. It, it looked like monkeys. It looked like apes. Yeah, that and, was from British um, Columbia. That's okay. So any, um, what are your thoughts on it? Are, is there any, uh, besides the native lore up there, uh, any carvings or anything that, um, that people talked about these things or done some artistic work? Well, on I, I know, right. I know somewhere up in that valley, there's some pictographs on some of the rocks. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember which tributary to the Copper River it is that there's some sheer rock faces and some caves back in there. And there's reports of pictographs back in there uh, depicting these things, uh, the hairy man, moose, caribou, basically creatures of the land around them. So there, there is that. I haven't put eyes on it myself. This is just something I heard through the grapevine, and I have not had a chance to explore because that that whole area is vast there are so many tributaries to the copper river and and to go and search out each one one at a time is a logistical nightmare uh just transporting there and back you know what i mean so i haven't gotten to that portion but uh, i'm compelled to look at least in a couple of the larger tributaries i mean there's reports out of horse creek there's a plateau it would be to the uh, I guess it would be the northeast side of the Copper River. And Horse Creek has a history of reports of the hairy man kidnapping people, eating people. Uh, that's the same area where those Atna hunters came across a group of hairy men uh, messing with human bones over this ridge. So there's there's all sorts of different small tidbits of information. And because of the location, it makes it very, very hard to get back in there and search out anything. And on top of that, to be honest, like one account after another of these things eating people and bones being found. I, I, I'm i kind of compelled to want to go out there and search out to see if I could find any human remains just, to, you know, just to see. But the other part of me is like, oh, hell no, <laughs> you know, stay out of there. You know what I mean? So. It, uh, it's it sounds like, yeah, it wouldn't be that important to me either. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't you want know. to be the next pile of bones. <laughs> hey, Fred, I Hello. got a question for you. Oh, yeah. I had heard of a case a while back, I can't remember how long ago, about the devil monkeys. And evidently there were three campers, they were, bo they were boys, and they went off into the woods and one of them disappeared. And they said a devil monkey took them. You ever heard, have you ever heard about that case? Um, I have. And see, that's another one where uh, the powers that be will claim misidentification and chalk it up to some kind of bear predation. And that's, that's a big roadblock. Like, just like missing people, there's strange disappearances all the time. Now, grant you, outside of the ones that want to go missing, the ones that are murdered, you know, all that stuff. Outside of that, there's some really strange accounts, and you can't get past the missing person bulletin to get any further information. They have their their cop out, which is open investigation. So you run into one roadblock after another after another to the point of, like, last year when I was starting the channel, I actually asked Tom for some help on trying to find the missing people reports outside of the bulletins, and he hit the same roadblock I did. Uh, there, there's no updating to the website up here as far as that goes. And all you can get is the uh, missing person bulletin. And that just says last known location and where they're addressed, you know, what they're addressed in. And that's it. Forrest, did you ever hear anything about devil monkeys when you lived in Alaska? Yes. And actually, uh, Fred and I talked about it last Friday. Um, I, I couldn't for the life of me. I actually had, uh, had heard about the Salcha. Case and I couldn't for the life of me remember what the name of the town was or the village uh, that that was uh, close to and uh, Fred remembered it uh, but I did uh, I had had the incident related to me by a friend of mine that's Athabascan up there 
and um, because she knew I was an anthropologist, and I I've always had an interest in it. I've always I'm always bugging Fred about it. He knows that, (laughs) and um, oh yeah. It's it's I, I find that real interesting, especially when you hear all these people that say, oh, well, we've never had any indication that there have been primates in the North American continent. Well, that's BS, uh, you know, and I think we've discussed this before. They're, they have actually found fossils here in Texas of lemur, lemur-like uh, um, animals, primates. So uh, there obviously it, it is a historical um uh, background in that so um and and fred is totally correct i mean i spent 17 years up in alaska and i'm here to tell you that people just disappear all the time i mean i knew of three individuals myself they just one day were there and then they then after that they weren't so and i mean they didn't choose to go missing so um you know it it is a wide and wonderful place to live but on the same token this is like I told Fred, be careful. You can't, you just don't go off. Uh, you know, if you were going to go looking for the devil monkeys, I think I'd take me a platoon of green berets with me. So, uh, they have a historical, uh, background and being murderous creatures. So just like Bigfoot up there, the Bigfoot up there are, I mean, they're not nice. They're just not nice. The accounts that you get from the natives up there will tell you they are not, they're not, they're not good accounts. I mean, they're not the friendly forest creatures. No, I still, you know, <laughs> all the I, I get reports all the time about uh, even brief encounters, even encounters where they just hear weird owl hoots, let's say, or real sharp whistles, or grunts, or, or the standard screams. Even when they don't see the creature itself. Every single person has conveyed the same thing, and that was they were terrified. Just something deep inside them was struck when they heard that sound, and they knew they were in danger even without putting eyes on the creature. And and to me, I, I go by my intuition. And, and you know, Forrest, you're right. I don't I don't go anywhere where there's reports by myself. I always have uh, people with me that. Uh, are on point, let's say, you know, uh, overwatch, so to speak, to where I can, you know, be looking around and not fully be focused on security because I'll get accounts and I'll try to go and check it out as quickly as possible, when possible. And there's been times I've made it to areas within 48 hours of an experience and there's still weird, crazy sounds going on off in the distance. Uh, I get reports from like uh chit and i just got one an email yesterday of a clinician that works at the health clinic there posted a video on facebook of some screams coming from the valley right there behind uh chit in the village proper and i was just down in that area we heard uh very similar things outside of the the orb activity and just all that other stuff there's also uh this lady has uh game crammer footage of two of these beings uh, on her property, and grant you, they're, they're glob squatch because it was a low-budget game camera. But knowing what I've known and seeing the, the 18-inch track being four inches deep in that, that hard-packed mud, uh, it had some serious weight to it. Now, me, I weigh 200 pounds, and I was I was stomping on one leg trying to get an impression into the ground, and I maybe got a quarter inch deep. Poor the baby's crying. Oh, yeah, all the time. That that and owl hoots are one of the most common ones. Uh, a cousin of mine, Elizabeth Osterhaus, back in 1967 or 69 on Unalaska Island, one of these creatures imitated a known baby from that village that they were aware of and used that baby cry to lure them outside. And luckily they saw it next to the porch and got back inside quickly. But the level of cunning to use a baby crying to lure its victim out, that's a level of predatory behavior that is just on another level of ugh. I've heard they do uh, that a lot when women are around. Yeah, and, and 
uh, both the women that were lured out, uh, they had kids in the house as well. So she wasn't sure if it was trying to lure them out to get to the kids. But once they saw the creature, they ducked back inside and it was looking in the window at them. And they had all the kids go in the back room and hide under the bed and stuff until it went away. But just just that level of, of cunning is just eerie. I mean, yeah. using a woman's natural instincts against them. Which, you know, kind of, it brings me to Mary Wilson. She went missing a year ago. Uh, July 12th was the last time she was seen. Reported missing July 14th. She had her grandson with her two-year-old grandson. They found her truck 6.9 miles up Stampede Trail outside of Healy uh, with the grandchild in the back. And she was nowhere to be seen. They found personal belongings of hers a a mile further up the trail. And no sign of her. Now, she wouldn't just, uh, being a caring grandparent, she would not just leave that child there. There had to be something compelling to keep the child hidden in the truck and for her to go missing on top of that with no trace to be found except for a couple personal belongings a mile away and not in the way of direction of help. That is another very eerie missing person case. Well, Fred, uh, you know, the that one video I watched uh, that you tell me that you just put out and uh, I'm trying to remember, was it the, the road that you were on? Was it arch archling or um, the one with the three oh, young men? Yes. Yes. With yes. The three young men. Yes. And I'm telling you what, when I watched that, you were giving me the creeps because all those alders that come down to the road and all that, that brush all up and down there and you walked up that road. I don't know how far. And, I, and oh, away from that, your was, uh, that was, <laughs> no, that was Archangel Valley. Yeah. I, yeah. Archangel, yeah. That was Archangel yeah. Valley. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that yeah. kid Austin, he, he came out from Anchorage that morning at yes. 630 yes. Uh, mm-hmm. to, sh- to show me exactly step by step what had happened. Uh, there was a lot of birds chirping. That's why I had the confidence to uh, walk up that road the way I did. Uh, well, you know, we were there chirping. about an hour. <laughs> oh, I did. That's the first thing I listened for when I, especially doing something like that. And trust me, uh, my personal safety comes first. If I would have felt uncomfortable, I would have just recorded from inside my Tahoe. Fred, this yeah. is this is Tracy. Um, I got a question for you. Um, yes. Is is it your opinion that they are dangerous? I mean, no matter oh, 100%. what your encounter is, you believe they're dangerous. 100%. But I, I'm biased. I I had an experience in 06 that uh, up until 06, I would have been like, eh, they make noise. You leave the area, you're fine. In 06, I saw the other side of the coin, and it, it was it was not it was not a fun experience. Uh, that we were basically, uh, pardon me. That was, that was my encounter. I, I, I thought I was in deep, excuse my French un, un, until I pulled my pistol and that thing, it, it scared it. But the whole time that encounter was happening, I thought I was in trouble and that, that was how I felt. You know, that was my feeling. And I just have the impression that if you meet one of these things, it's not going to be good for you. No, not at all. And, and I've, I've actually put shots on these things to, to no avail, but, uh, actually I did an interview with William. Uh, what number was it? Like one thirty nine, William? Yeah, I, I think it was. Yeah, uh, I did an interview with William about the experience, if you want to go back and check it out. Um, but basically what happened was is we ended up on the Neocuck River to do some prospecting. And a half hour after dark, the whole place creaked. Uh, we assumed a bear, went out to look for the bear. There was no bear, but there's three sets of eyes shine at the tree line to our left. And we ducked back in. Next thing I know, my cousin's under the table trembling. We notice he's looking across to the other window. I look over, I see a face in the window and I could only see from the bottom of the nose to the top of the eyebrow of this creature. And everything was said in the look it gave me in in a couple microseconds. 
it started moving away from the window and I put three shots through the wall with my 12 gauge. And then it was just a night of sheer craziness. And the next morning I put three shots on one center mass. It stopped moving forward, but it didn't flinch or anything. And I shot it with a 30 out six, man. We kill walrus with that gun. So I, I, I don't feel there's anything good that could come of any interaction with these things, like people who are feeding them, habituating them, all that stuff. I, I think they're setting themselves up for something horrible. Well, you know, you see, I, I talked to someone after my encounter, and one of the things I had done earlier that day, I had bought a bag of fruit, uh, apples and bananas, I think some oranges, and I had actually eaten an apple and a banana while I was sitting there on the side of the road. And um, some people say that they thought, they think it may have been the smell of the fruit that attracted these these things to me. I didn't feel that way when when what happened happened. I did not feel that way. I thought I was in trouble. And yeah. I've been in trouble many times you in my life. Work. Do what? Oh, I said you more than likely were in trouble. That's my honest honest belief. I mean, I think I was the one in trouble. They weren't after fruit. I mean, because down here in the South, there's all kind of edible things, especially that time of the year. Um, fruit, nuts, you know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. There would be no reason they would come sniffing after some bananas. Hey, Tracy, it was and raining too, wasn't it, that day, that evening? It was storming very hard. Yeah, that see, that, uh, that low ascent wouldn't have carried very far anyway. Not in those conditions. And that was my thinking. That was my thinking when they told me that. You know, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Um, and, and the look on this creature's face wasn't one of, hey, where the fruit? It was, um, Hey, you're in trouble. <laughs> you know, that was my impression. And yeah, you know the the looks they give us uh, of pure disgust and disdain. I, I've yet to hear anyone say that uh, they felt uh, outside of some young ladies. Uh, I don't want to give up their village because that's for anonymity, but. Uh, she was four wheeling at a berry patch and they were just checking out certain patches of tundra to see how the salmon berries were coming along uh, pre-picking season just to get an idea of, you know, where the berries are going to be the best. And at one point that they, they had uh, a two mile stretch between wood lines and about a good 600 yards to a pond off in the distance on this big horseshoe shaped four wheeler trail. And there was nothing to be seen the whole time. They were just, her and her little cousin were just four wheeling around. There was one trail. It was heavily rutted just for, you know, from use. And they just used the one trail so they weren't tearing up all the tundra. And about the halfway point of the horseshoe, all of a sudden, there's this big creature standing there, a hairy man. And she said that she felt like she was in a trance. She felt like uh, because this creature was waving to them, she felt initially like an overwhelming sense of peace, like it was her grandpa calling her over, right? Well, so she turns the four-wheeler and goes off trail and luckily went over some bumps and banged her knee. And when she banged her knee, it snapped her out of that trance and she saw it for what it was and they got out of it. So, uh, you know, there's uh, still it, it, nothing good. Nothing good. And now all of your encounters that you're talking about, they, they took place in Alaska? Yes, sir. My encounter took place in northeastern Mississippi, uh, right across the Alabama-Mississippi state line. And most of the reports I've read about these creatures around here, they weren't um, just somebody seeing one run across the road or walking up on one in the woods and it turned and walked away. They're usually very aggressive. I, and I thought it was just down here where, where where they were aggressive, but I guess it's 
everywhere. It's it's all over. I've done this for five decades. I've never once heard a, a fuzzy, happy story of somebody's encounter with one. Never once. Once up in Alaska, and Fred can attest to this, you're talking about critters that are 10, 12, 15 feet tall. Oh, yeah. A lot bigger than what we have down here. Averaging here's. about, yep, averaging most encounters, if I was to average them out, it would be between 10 and 12 foot tall. And I, I think the biggest one that I saw may have been about eight feet or a little over, you know. The others, the other three that was with it, two were significantly smaller, probably about six and a half to seven feet. Um, the, the other one, he was about the size height wise of the big guy, but he wasn't as big as the big guy. Right. And another thing about up here is I'll get reports of them looking like a oversized Chewbacca, a little more lanky. And then you got the, like the ones I saw up on the New Yuck, they were massive and real robust. All the way to, uh, like, on the Kuskokwim Delta, the yukon Kuskokwim Delta, the, I've heard reports of smaller, all-black ones, and they use, like, bone knives and things of that nature. So so there's some tools being used by some of these creatures, and that's unnerving in itself to think about one of these things having a bone knife and using it to cut up someone's fishing net to get the salmon out. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah, I have some footage from uh, Stellawick. It was sent to me, um, and it, it's on cell phone camera, but you can see this large creature, uh, like a reddish brown, and it's walking in the tall sawgrass. And according to the locals, that sawgrass is about five foot tall, and this thing's a good four to five feet taller than the grass in perspective. And it's carrying something white. And what I heard about the backstory is, uh, an elder had a small brailer of fish that he was getting ready to process, but had to go inside to, to handle something and came back out and it was missing. And so happenstance, this person sees this thing moving along, starts recording it with her cell phone. And in the footage, you see a little kid on a three wheeler uh, come ripping up the road, doesn't notice the creature because it's way off in the distance in the sawgrass, but the kid was actually trying to help the elder find the missing brailer of fish. And in the background, you see this creature carrying uh, basically the white brailer under its arm heading towards the river. It, it was just, just some crazy footage. Nothing like, you know, uh, I guess, you know, it, not even close to the level of Patterson Gimlin, but in context, it's some creepy stuff. I mean, you got a little kid looking to help an elder and meanwhile, the hairy man's off behind them, just moving along, you know, not a care in the world, heading for the riverbank. Fred, have you ever had any instances of uh, anybody seeing them on the islands off the coast? Oh, yeah. Uh, got a report from St. Lawrence Island. Uh, I got a picture from the guy. Uh, his wife and daughter were chased by one on a four-wheeler, and St. Lawrence Island is a rock windswept island with no trees just some caves up in the mountain and uh you know they they got a a photo of it there um and they have a long history of the hairy man on those islands as well and uh what i was telling you about my cousin elizabeth osterhaus on on alaska mm -hmm. that's an island that's connected to dutch harbor what do you think maybe they're feeding on the seals and stuff out there I suspect so. Um, you know, the, a lot of the places, they have a large fishing industry and also a lot of marine life washes up on shore. Because like when I was interviewing the guy, Mike, on St. Lawrence Island, uh, he we were talking and he goes, you know how your dog will go and roll around in a dead whale? And, and so his perspective is everyone's dog rolls around in a dead whale, although that doesn't happen for a lot of us. You know, we don't have whales washing up on shore like they do up there so there's there's a lot of different food sources you know whether it be shellfish marine life uh you know locals in there whatever stealing dogs there's a lot of reports of dogs going missing and dogs being hurt to lure people out as well well that one incident with i think it was it roscoe now i may be wrong on the dog uh the one that the 
Oh, rebel. Um, rebel. Rebel. Oh, the one that uh, that he uh, they had in. Uh, the Sasquatch had injured and looked like it broken the back legs and then was using the dog. The dog was still alive and he was, he was trying to entice uh, the, the, the owner to come up and rescue the dog, I guess. And uh, Sasquatch's mind, he was going to get two for the price of one. But then when that didn't work out, he just took and smashed the dog up against a tree. And I was just, I, I still can't get that out of my mind. Oh my gosh. Yeah, uh, his name is Don. He he moved out of state after that. He shot one of them in the back with a forty five seventy that was by his truck when he was getting the hell out of Dodge, and uh, <laughs> he moved back down to Illinois uh, to be closer to his daughter. He had lived on that property for ten years, not not a single sign of a problem or nothing. Had that dog Rebel for about seven years, and then just randomly that fall that that stuff happened and it it's just uh that level of cunning using our love against us you know whether it be for children or our love you know our, the way we love our critters and and to me that's just a level of evil that's just uh just uh it just it saddens me fred i gotta Bruce? agree with you a thousand percent it really is it's these things I was just telling uh, Will, I think these are the Charles Manson of the primate world. But one of the questions that I have is I've heard some accounts, and I'm wondering if you can substantiate or if you've heard of any of this, where the creatures have actually attacked and killed uh, Alaskan brown bears, or you know, maybe a polar bear for that matter. But uh, I haven't heard that, but I have heard where they do have the uh, strength and the ability. Yeah. I, I have heard something. Uh, I heard it from an elder when I was little. They, uh, these two old timers back when they were still using uh, little 30 foot sailboats to salmon fish, which is a level of toughness I can't even wrap my mind around. <laughs> but they would drift with the tide and pull the nets in by hand and use the sail to make it home, basically. But anyway, they went up to what's known as Bear Bay at Aleknagik, which is by Bear Creek. And they went in there, and they were anchored up. They were going to get some, uh, I forget the native word, but basically red salmon before they spawn out. They like the row. And also the, the males get this big hump on their back, right? And so they like to cut that off and eat it raw. So they were up in there to harvest some of that, and they, they anchored out. And it was early in the morning, and they heard a bear squalling on shore and saw the bear running. And it was a large bear, uh, 800 to 1,000 pounds. And one of these things was chasing it. And as it reached Bear Creek, another one was on the opposite side of the creek and jumped down on top of this bear. And basically, they both jumped on it and started ripping it apart and was basically scooping blood out of its cavity. And then, con you know, continued to eat the liver and some of other, the other organs and then uh, basically left it. Fred, um, this is Tracy again. Um, what What is your native tribe, and do you know the word that your elders call these things? Oh, we call it uh, Jakayak, which is uh, basically means monster. And uh, I'm from the Sukpiak tribe, which is uh, that that's the the proper saying. But uh, we're Aleut. And basically, that's a Russian word for coastal dweller. Um, yeah, it's uh, the the current name is Chugyang. Chugyang. Yeah, Chugyang. It, it gets real throaty real fast. Trust me. I, I used to be pretty fluent in Yupik when I was a kid, but nowadays I, I find it hard to pronounce some of the some of the words it, it sounds like you're uh, uh, no disrespect to the language but it sounds like you're you're hawking up a loogie almost with some of the words you know yes and and i had a i had an aunt a great aunt who was a full blood creek indian and uh when i was younger she she passed away when i was like 19 years old i was up in the army when she passed away um but she would speak to us a lot in, you know, the Creek language. She would teach us this. But she had a word for them, 
And it basically meant the hairy people of the woods. But I cannot remember the word that she called them. Uh, it was a very long and hard to pronounce word. And but I, I just right, remember right. her her telling us about the hairy people of the woods to watch out for them. And if we see them to walk away, you know, don't, don't go near them. Don't mess with them, you know? Um, right. And, and, uh, me and William have had this conversation before. There are certain native tribes that didn't have a close as, uh, interactions with them and they viewed them differently than those natives who had a more close interaction with them. Like, uh, some of the Athabascan tribes call it the one who runs and hides and other, tribes that you know they they call it a monster a man stealer man eater so you know it, it kind of varies tribe to tribe but there's so many different names for it up here i geez i i need to start compiling them and maybe make a small dictionary of the words used from the different tribes because each region has its own unique outlook on it and that would uh, be an interesting boot right there <laughs> Yeah, and you know, again, it, getting uh, getting native elders to talk, it, it takes some warming up to them, so they know you're not just uh, uh, a gus up, basically. You know, um, they got to know exactly. you're sincere, and then they open right up. Yeah, it really depends. Sometimes uh, I know my own experience, not anywhere near yours, Fred, but uh, <clears throat> like what you mentioned, you know, about the different different tribes and their how they view it is based on their experiences with them. Um, you know, when I was writing my first book, I was contacting some different uh, native artisans, and I was just asking, getting their permission to use photographs of their, their carvings for uh, ceremonial masks. And one of them was a, a Hyatt elder and a chief, and he told me, he says, well, he says, sure, you can use, you can use the pictures, or, or no problem. But he says, you know, he says, when you, when you talk to different groups, he says, you have to understand that you know how they view the creatures is based on their experiences with them or the lack of so um you know and i've heard this from you know when we were talking to win and with the flatheads and uh, some other folks said basically the same thing you know when they had a lot of close contact and and it was never anything friendly they they would flat out tell you they were man eaters and and they were monsters I'm so yeah, I mean, I'm still alive, so I can talk to her about this now. Right. And the overwhelming majority, outside of a small handful of tribes, would declare it a monster. Uh, you know, watch your women and children. <laughs> That's the overwhelming outlook on these creatures up here. And uh, I'm sure some of the tribes have an origin story, of, you know, for them. But for the majority of the part, you ask an elder, they'll just say they've always been here. Uh, and and in context of they will kill you and eat you. Those are the <laughs> exact words that my aunt used to us when we were kids. When we asked her about them, she would just say that they've always been here. And uh, you don't need to be around them. It's not good. Things will not work out good for you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she said they had always been around and she said she didn't know where they came from. They've always been around. That was her words. But at that now, time, I know some of the tribes like, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to say at that time, um, you know, I, I was born and raised down here in Alabama and, uh, I had seen the Patterson Gimlin film. I had seen TV shows, but they were always out. West in California, Oregon, Washington State, uh, Alaska, Canada, you know, everything I had ever heard or read about, it didn't happen over here, you know. And we always thought that it was just heard trying to make us behave and not, you know, go too far away in the woods and, and stuff when we would go stay at her place, you know. Um, I know now that she was talking about something that's real. And, you know, I was 15 years old at that time. And, and we just, we thought it was like ghost stories, you know. We didn't, we didn't put much into it and everything. But she really believed. 
And I realize that now. She really believed. She really knew. And that's hey, why I say Tracy, I wish she was alive right now so that I could talk to her. I, I wish she was, too. Where was um, where was her tribe at? Where, where was she located that she would have, you know, was it kind of where you live now? Or where was this? Are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah. Um, not far from here, about 100 miles from here. Um, uh Montgomery, Alabama is a state capital. Wetumpka is 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 close to where her place was. Well, the reason I ask is um, so there is there's not only historic precedent for them in that area, but also uh, the Native Americans uh, had they knew darn good and well the things were there. She she was a Porch Creek tribe member tribal member. She was from Porch, Alabama, which is down south of Montgomery. And her and my great uncle met right after World War II. And they married and he had bought some land up around Wetumpka, uh, near Wetumpka. And, uh, you know, it was, it, he had like four or 500 acres and there was a river on one edge of it. There was creeks that went all across it. So it was all just woods and kind of a little small farm, you know. He passed away when I was like eight or nine years old. He passed, I barely remember him. I do remember him. But uh, I mostly remember going and spending time with her after he passed away, you know. It was a fun place for us to go. Yeah, you know, when you brought up the Patterson-Gimlin footage, the, the first time I saw that was outside of Alaska. And when I first saw it, I honestly thought it was filmed up in Sunshine Valley, north of Electingate. I had no idea about, you know, uh, its its uh, origin story being in, uh, for the footage anyway, being in California. I thought it was legit. I thought it was in Sunshine Valley until I was corrected and told it was California. And then, you know, as a kid, I started talking about the hairy man and then kids start making fun of you. So I just, I learned then to, you know, just keep it quiet and whatnot. But yeah, I, I there's something about there, you know, I, I get a lot of uh, grief from some of the people that will email me uh, about my channel saying, where's all the evidence? Where, wh why aren't you showing evidence? If you cannot accept, Accept the evidence that's already out there. There is nothing I could bring to the table that you would accept either. You know what I mean? Uh, exactly. There's so many naysayers that just refuse to accept. Now, grant you, there's a lot of hoax bullcrap out there, but those who know and have had experiences can easily pick out the legit footage. There's certain. There's a certain aura around legitimate footage, legitimate incidents. You know what I mean? There's there's certain telltale signs, and they just don't accept it. And for those people, I, I got nothing for them. You know what I mean? I, it would be pointless for me to go through the energy and effort to try to prove something to them that they're not going to accept regardless, you know? You know, Fred, that's exactly correct. That's been my experience. You cannot give them enough information because they don't want it. They they seem to get all their energy from writing on the coattails of a very t popular topic and then coming along and debunking it. And so it's, yeah, I my my experience has been exactly like you. Just don't even don't even engage them. Well, and like I tell all of you here, you know, that I don't need to go out and look for them to prove that they're out there because I know they are, you know, I, I don't, exactly. I have no desire to go out and see another one again. I know they're out there and, and I'm just extremely interested in all of this, but yeah, I don't, I don't want to go <coughs> banging sticks on trees in the woods and hooting and hollering and everything to see if I can find one because they're out there. And I didn't feel comfortable when I first, when I saw that one. So, hey, if, if that's, that's what you won't go for, you know, I just can't do it. And another thing is these things blend in 
their environment so seamlessly that if they don't move, you're not going to see them. I've had handfuls of reports of people assuming that's a tree stump over there. And then it moves or then it, they notice it's looking at them. You know what I mean? And, and so it, the average person just out and about, if this thing ain't moving, they're overlooking it left and right. They're, they're just uh, masters of camouflage. They know their environment far better than we do. You know, it would be like someone coming into our house to find us. And if we didn't want them to find us, they're, they're probably not going to. You know what I mean? Uh, it's along I, I the same lines. What you mean. And, I do know what you mean. And, I've, I've learned, I've learned and, from talking to Will and the people here on the show that there were times when I was hunting, fishing, just out roaming the woods and doing things. There was one close to me, and I just did not know it. There were a lot of things that happened that I couldn't explain, but every time I listen to this show and every time I participate, I hear things that 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 go right up along with something that happened to me one time when I was out there hunting, you know. So, yeah, they, they're out there. They've been out there. I just never knew it. Yeah, I've also got reports of these things imitating people's voices to a T as well. Um, I I got a, a report from a couple. Uh, the guy's name was Alvin and uh, his wife, Myrna. They were at Devil's Pass, which is down on the Kenai Peninsula, and they had a young nine-month-old uh, Tibetan master uh, named Skippy. They called him Skip because as a puppy, he had an awkward little prance that looked kind of like a skip and the, the name stuck well for a couple hours while they were walking uh his wife myrna was saying come on skip come on skippy every so often to get the dog you know from paying attention to the brush or whatever it was doing because there was still snow on the ground to where they were going up to these switchbacks that doubles past there and this thing in the tree line uh just up ahead of them imitated her voice and inflection to a T and coaxed the dog over there. And before the dog realized that, oh, that ain't mom, uh, the thing snatched it up and ran off through the trees. And for it to imitate a voice, uh, Alvin was confused because when he first heard it coming from the direction of not his wife, he turned around to make sure it wasn't just an echo from her behind him. She was behind him about 25 yards. And for them to have that ability, uh, that's scary. That's very scary. Because you could be with a group of very good buddies, and all of a sudden, let's say your buddy Dave is calling you, hey, Fred, hey, Fred, come here. If it sounds just like Dave, I'm going to go over there and check it out. You know what I mean? And so that that mimicry is, is one of the scariest things. We had things like that happen on my hunting club, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Very creepy stuff. Very. I mean... Well, Fred, as usual, you, you managed to make the hair on my neck rise up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's just you missing Alaska for us. I know, sweetie. I Trust me. Little <laughs> late, I've really been missing it. <laughs> I keep telling the guys, I'm going to call Fred and tell him to buy me buy me some property up there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a it's a love hate relationship. Midway through winter, you're hating it, you know, as you well know. You don't have to explain that one to me. I know when we left, my husband and I left out of bed. It was ten feet of snow on either side. It looked like you were driving through a snow tunnel. <laughs> you have all added yeah, more check the... marks to the reason why I don't want to visit Alaska. I used to want to visit Alaska, but I don't think so now. <laughs> It's the most beautiful country you've ever in your life seen. I mean, Fred can attest to that. But it's it's also a, uh, a very uh, <laughs> unforgiving uh, country. And you just, it's not something that you can just, uh, you know, take lightly. You have to respect it. Yeah. Like I try to tell people all the time, they'll, they'll email me and say, oh, what's it like living in Alaska? I want to move up there. And I'm like, well... The first thing to remember is Alaska don't give a flying rat's patootie about you. 
and most things up here <laughs> once you're dead. So <laughs> as long as you can deal with that, you, you'll you, you'll be all right. <laughs> the lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. <laughs> Yeah, the moose will stomp you to death. They're used to fighting brown bears. They sure as hell ain't scared of you, and you can't give moose a warning shot. They just look at you like, what the hell is that supposed to do? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, they, it gets it gets scary fast. Well, they, they, they're more moose. There are more people killed in Alaska by moose than there are by, by bears. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they can they can be downright vicious, especially the cows. I mean, bulls in the rut are one thing, but cows are, are dangerous all the time. Uh, female caribou will grow horns, but there's a, a difference between the size and shape of the horns on caribou. Caribou have, the males have what they call the shovels, which are like uh, two small hand-like protrusions off the front of the antlers that kind of look like uh, if you're holding your hands out in front of you and you, you cupped your fingers in towards each other, kind of like you were uh, like one of those little grabber monkey deals. And then the females, are they don't have that. So, and, and they're a little bit smaller. But, yeah, uh, moose cows, they don't, they don't have antlers. But they can still stomp a mud hole in you. Oh, and walk it dry. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'll just hang out down here around these mud holes. There's nothing that big that can get you. It's a little stuff you didn't worry about. Yeah, I mean, we don't have poisonous snakes or anything like that, which is, thank God, it's it's rough enough without all that. But, yeah, it's it's a different world, but it's beautiful, and it gets in your blood. You, you, I know people that came up for a visit, and they're still here 30 years later, you know. But, again, it's not for everyone because uh, – the winters are brutal. Uh, they seem like they're never ending when they're happening. And, you know, you can go weeks at a time at 30 or 40 below zero with the winds blowing, and it is vicious. Hey, Fred. Uh, yeah. Fred, did you ever hear anything or do you know anything about that show, Alaskan Killer Bigfoot, that used to come on? I think it came on one season. And then I heard they canceled the show because they actually ran into some serious problems out there. But they didn't specify. Well, yeah. And uh, from what I heard from the locals down that way, uh, once they started actually uh, attempting to go further away from uh, Port Chatham, Port Lock proper, back in towards some of those valleys, that's when the real deal started kicking up and just the noises alone scared them off. I, I attempted to watch that show and the very first episode I attempted to watch, all of a sudden there's this native elder down on the beach that supposedly went out of his way to come down there and warn them. And I know for a fact, native elders do not do that. They will not chase you down to the beach to catch you before you leave. No, they'll catch wind of your excursion, call you to their house for dinner, and tell you in private how stupid you are. They are not going to chase you down to a beach. It just doesn't happen. That guy was paid to do that. Well, an elder, you go to their home. You don't. They don't come to you. Exactly. And they won't tell you themselves you're invited. One of your other relatives would be like, oh, you got to go to dinner over here. And you go. Yeah, it's always a third party that does it for you. Yeah. Yeah, they never come. And when I saw that, I, I at first I had, oh, hey, Killer Bigfoot, maybe they're getting to some real stuff here. And then it went fluff. And then they over-dramatized each step they took, which is unnecessary because it's creepy enough in that damn place without that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, guys, I hate to say it, but we're out of time. Any uh, anything final, everyone? You want to yeah, ask Fred I anything? Was or? Out of time too. What was that? Oh, I was saying good timing because I was running out of time myself. Oh, buddy. okay. Well, Fred, <laughs> listen, we always appreciate you coming on, man, and and giving us updates, and it's always a pleasure, and we want to get your uh, your channel out there too, so. 
Yeah, thanks for joining us. Oh, for- no, and I appreciate it. Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Anytime I can, man, I'm, I'm down for the cause. Well, I checked out your channel while while we're doing the show. It's very good. You did an excellent job on it, so I recommend people check it out. And, Fred, thanks again. Very, very interesting updates. Stay safe out there, Fred. Oh, always, man, always. I love your new intro on your show. And, uh, as always, you take care, sweetie, and be safe. Oh, yeah, for sure. And you got my number, for us. You know how to get a hold of me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love talking to you. <laughs> Appreciate it. And, hey, thanks again, Will. Yo, Fred, anytime, buddy. Anytime, man. And uh, everyone, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.